Hello everybody and welcome back to this new video. Today we're going to be taking a look at the third challenge from the intro to binary exploitation track from Hack the Box. This is Optimistic. If you haven't seen the last two videos, I have a playlist for uh, this whole track, so check them out first because we're going to be building on that knowledge. So first of all, let's get started with Optimistic. So we have a binary again, it's an elf binary, it's 64 bit and it's not stripped. So that's really nice. Uh, and then we're gonna, gonna do a check sec here to check what security is set on it. And we see that NX is disabled, so we can actually execute uh, shellcode on the stack uh, that we uploaded there. So that's great uh, to know. So, so that's probably the exploit that we'll, we'll be going for here. Okay, let's run this binary to see what is going on. So we're gonna run optimistic. It's gonna say, welcome to the positive community. Would you like to enroll yourself? If we say no, it's, uh, it's just exits. If we say yes, we get a small gift, and this seems to be uh, an address, um, a stack address, maybe, because we can see that the address is very high. It starts with 7F, and, and high addresses usually, the stack is usually, uh, usually has high addresses. Then it asks us for an email address, so if we enter as an email address something, uh, we can enter an H. Then it asks us for the length of a name, so let's pick four, and let's do a name. Oh, and we have an alarm clock apparently. Okay, so that just closed the application. Let's run it again. Okay, uh, we typed five characters here and we see that only four were taken in by the application before it ended. With a thank you, we'll be in touch soon. Okay, so that is the flow of this application. So first of all, this alarm clock, that is stupid. I don't like that. Uh, so maybe we can patch that out of the binary. But first of all, let's take a look at the code here. Okay, so I've opened it in Ghidra, and let's take a look. So first of all, in the main function, we have this this initialize here. We can see that this in initialize here is going to set the alarm, and this alarm function is going to take in uh, 30 seconds, uh, and then the alarm is going to go off. Well, what if we patch this binary and just make this alarm be something like way higher than 30 seconds, so we have a lot of time. So let's see how we could do that. So we see that, okay, here, it moves 1E into EDI, so that's BF 1E. What if we patch that instruction to be BF FF, so we have 255 seconds. I think that will be plenty for us, and that way we don't actually have to do difficult patching, we can just patch this one byte. So how are we going to do this? Well, since this is such a simple patch, let's use GHEX, which is a hex editor. Uh, so GHEX on optimistic. Okay, so we get this menu here, we can do uh, a find here, so find, it was bf1e, and we find that here, so that's the only one we find as well. So we can change that to be bfff, then we can save that as a file, which I've already done, and if we do that, then we, uh, we save that as a patched binary, and now we have this patched binary that we can run. That's not gonna have these issues. Okay, so now that we've patched out this alarm clock, let's dig deeper into this binary. Let's look at what else happens here. So let's go back to our main function. And in our main function, let's take a look at what's going on. So okay, we have our output. We're gonna get this question. We enter a character. Okay, if that character is yes, then obviously we uh, if that character is not yes, then we exit, which we don't want, because we want to keep going. Okay, then we're getting this small gift. And like I said before, this gift is most likely a stack address. Well, let's dig some deeper into this. So this is a printf function here that has it as a second parameter. So let's take a look at this printf. Oh, not like that. At this printf right here. Okay. So we call this printf and then we have this weird second parameter that we don't really know what is what it is, but we can figure that out from looking at the assembly code. So printf is going to be called and it's going to have some arguments, right? So in RDI here, we have the first argument, and then in RSI, we're gonna have the second argument. So that's how uh, arguments work. If you want the full list, you can easily Google it here. So for example, RDI is gonna have the format string, RSI is the, uh, then the second argument, RDX the third, and so on. Um, so that, that's how arguments work. Okay, so we need to find out what is in our SI because that's what we are going to show here 
with this percentage p, and percentage p is going to show a hexadecimal address for a pointer, so, so the pointer address. Okay, let's see, RSI, so here we move RAX, this is probably kind of small, but we'll just look at this really quickly. So we move RAX into RSI, uh, but before that we move RBP into RAX. What is RBP? Well, RBP stands for, um, I have this uh, image up here maybe, yeah, here. So EBP is the same as RBP, and RBP is the base pointer. I've already shown this slide in, a, in the another video, but uh, the base pointer pretty much is a pointer to the stack address, to a stack address for that function, so that way we have a kind of an offset to get to the other arguments that this function is, has. So for example, if we take a look here at, uh, here we're loading something in, and we're using RBP because we have this offset from the stack. That's what RBP is. So okay, RBP is a stack address, and, and we know its location on the stack, right, right here. And and the and RBP is set in the beginning of every function. And we're going to move our SP, so the stack pointer, into our BP. Cool. So we have an address on the stack. Great. Let's move on. So please uh, provide your details. Now yeah, we have an email address. We're going to read eight bytes into this uh, this eight byte long buffer. Okay. Nothing wrong with that. We're going to read another eight bytes into another eight byte long buffer. Then we have the length of the name. And here we are reading um, we are reading this data thing here, and this data thing contains percentage D, so we're reading an integer into local 84, and local 84 is an unsigned integer. Now, reading an integer in an unsigned integer, that is something interesting. Um, might cause a integer over or under flow. But let's, let's look a little further to see, um, but let's keep that in mind, knowing that we might have an integer uh, overflow or underflow here. So okay, that's going to say if that input is bigger than 64, uh, well, we shouldn't be that optimistic. That's not allowed because that input is then, that number that we just inputted is then used uh, for the amount of bytes that we, that we can read in as the name. And that's what we saw before when we entered one more than, we, than the number we entered, it, it wouldn't take it. So we can enter the amount of bytes that we read, but it can be bigger than 64. Okay. But um, before here, I, I already said um, that uh, we might have an integer under our overflow here. And suddenly that became very interesting, because if we could overflow this integer, if you could make it very big, then we might be able to read a very big amount of bytes into this buffer that's only 96 bytes long. So that, that, that could cause us to have a buffer overflow, which we could then abuse um, to get shellcode uh, executed. Okay, let's see how this works. So we have, we're reading an integer in an unsigned integer. Now, what is an unsigned integer exactly? Well, let's take a look here at this, at this graph here. So an integer has a negative and a positive range. And okay, that's, that's logical, but an unsigned integer only has a positive range, but an unsigned integer uses the same amounts of, amount of bits as a signed integer, and therefore it has a larger range at the top here. So it has more space, it can be bigger, but not smaller. Okay, now what happens when we overflow uh, an integer, a normal integer here? So if we pick a value that's above here, so like one plus the maximum, then it would loop back to the beginning. Same goes for if we pick a value that's smaller than the smallest value, we would loop back to the beginning. And the same happens for an unsigned integer. If we try to put minus one in here, it's not gonna fit here because this, this starts at zero and it's gonna jump all the way here and it's gonna be uh, one, 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 or FFFF uh, in hex. So the biggest number possible. Okay, so that's interesting because we are reading an integer so we could enter minus one here and we would get a very big unsigned value here. Let's see what happens when we do that. So okay, we read minus one into this variable. So this variable is gonna be very big, the biggest value possible. Then we are gonna go into this check. And this check, like I said, it says, okay, this input that we gave can't be bigger than 64. However, before it checks that, it's going to cast it to an integer. Okay, so let's see on the graph here where we have a value that's right here, and we are casting that into this. Now that clearly isn't gonna work because, well, it doesn't fit, there is no place here. So it's gonna cast this back to minus one. 
and minus 1 is smaller than 64, and therefore we're not going to go into this if statement, and we can uh, enter this name with a very large amount of bytes, which is going to allow us to overflow this buffer. Uh, and that's the theory here. So let's see if we can actually get that to work. So uh, let's quickly print a lot of text here. So Python dash C print A times 500. Okay. Run our binary again. Yes, something, something, minus one for the length of the name and then our long name. And we see we get a segmentation fault. And the segmentation fault occurs when we've overflown the buffer and it tried to uh, jump through a return address that, that wasn't code. Okay. So cool, we have a buffer overflow. That's amazing. What's next? Well, let's try to put this buffer overflow into code so we can actually start creating some shell code and playing around with it and seeing if we can exploit this. So I've, I've already built a lot of these scripts in my past videos in the playlist, so check them out if you want to see that. First of all, we take the process from our binary here. I then always take a zeros, uh, a moment to enumerate the binary and write down some information that could be useful. For example, we set the context to be Linux and AMD64. We got this from running the file command. Then we are going to have to find the padding length. What is the padding length? Well, that's, a, that's the amount of... of, of um, padding we will need to get to our return address. So we're, we're overwriting a buffer here. So on stack we'll have the buffer and then we'll have the return address. Um, and what is this padding length going to be? Well, it's going to be the length of this buffer and then some unknown stuff in between, in between here possibly uh, until we overwrite this return address. So we want to find this length here. How do we do that? Well, I've done that before in my other videos. So I've done that here in the bad computer video at this timestamp here. So check that out if you want to see that. Uh, okay. So then the stack address offset, we'll, we'll take a look at that later. But then the second step I take is get uh, the stack address. Uh, normally in, in difficult, in more difficult uh, binaries, you have to leak it yourself. But here we got it as a gift. So for this code, again, in this video right about here. I also show how to do that. So take a look at that video if you want to see how to do that. But then let's get to the stack address offset now. So the stack address we leaked, we know it is somewhere on the stack, but we want to know what its location is in relation to where we are overriding. So in relation to this buffer overflow, to this beginning of this buffer, how many bytes is the difference? Okay, let's calculate that. So we can calculate that by taking a look uh, here at the top. We know that the stack address we get is RBP. RBP at the top is being set in the beginning by moving the stack pointer into RBP. Okay, let's take a look at the stack again. So uh, that was here. So in the stack we have our stack pointer. It's going to be here then. And our buffer is the last argument, so our buffer would be right on top of where RBP is. So that means that we would have to jump back 96 bytes in order to get to the beginning of our buffer, right? Because let's imagine this as a stack, exactly like this. Here is where our stack pointer would be, and we want to jump back to the beginning of this line here. So we would have to jump back 96 characters. You can also calculate this yourself. Um, by just going using IDA and, and checking out where everything is in relation to each other, uh, where the leaked address is in relation to the beginning of your input. So, but I like to calculate this as well to see, okay, is that possible? Can I do that? Okay, so we know we need to jump back 96 bytes. And that's what we do here as well. So the stack address, we add our offset, and our offset is minus 96. So we have the stack address where we want to jump to, where we want to put our shellcode, where we can put our input. So then the second step is to start creating a payload. So for my first payload, I am just going to use this padding length and then some random extra uh, stuff here just to see if our code is also going to get a segmentation fault so that I know that the rest of our code works fine. Uh, and then the last step is to trigger the overflow. So we're going to enter an email, enter an H. We're going to enter minus one for the length of the name and then enter our payload as the name uh, and go into interactive mode. So let's run this code and see what happens here. 
So running this, we notice that we go, uh, we get this thank you, we'll be in touch soon. And we get this exit code minus 11, which is a segmentation fault. And that's exactly what we wanted to see here because, well, we wanted to see if we could get the segmentation fault. Great, now we can move on to the next part. And that's trying to introduce some shellcode here. So I'm gonna use this very basic form of shellcode that we have used before in the other videos. So check that out if you want more information. Um, but then obviously we are gonna add the shellcode to the beginning of our padding, because that's the beginning, that's the stack address here is the beginning of this, of our payload, of our input. But obviously the padding length has to be different then because it has to take account in account the length of our shellcode. So what we do is the padding length, we remove the length of the shellcode from it and that's how much padding we need. Okay, perfect. So if we do that, what happens? Well, let's run it and we see, oh, we get sorry, that's an invalid name and an end of file. So that's not good because, well, up here we got thank you, we'll be in touch soon. And now we get this other message, message saying that's an invalid name. Okay, let's take a look at the code here and see what is going on. So that's happening down here. So after our input here, it's going to jump into a while loop. And we can see our two statements here. So in the thank you, we'll be in touch soon. Afterwards, it's gonna return. And we want to return because this return is going to jump to our stack address, which holds our um, shell code, which is going to be executed. However, after this, sorry, that's an invalid name, we see an exit, an exit that's not good because then it's not gonna jump to our address, it's just gonna exit the application and our shellcode is not going to be executed. So we do not want to reach this exit and we want to get to this return. So all right, let's check this while loop out that we are in. So we're gonna while true and we see a break over here. Okay, so we want this to never break. So, we want, so pretty much we want to make sure that this if statement uh, never is true. <clears throat> but, but we want to jump into this if statement. So let's take a look at this one. So sfar2 here, and sfar2 comes from here, which is the return value from this read. And the return value from a read is the amount of bytes that were read into this, into this uh, buffer here. So what is this value going to be? Well, that's going to be the length of our input. We're gonna do minus nine. Okay, and that has to be smaller than this variable, local 84, which is initialized at zero. And if we look here, it's and with every iteration, it's incremented by one. So, okay, this is, seems like a loop over our input, over all of our input except for the last nine bytes. Okay, so we're gonna loop over our input and every for every character, we are going to check this here. This is gonna do is alpha. What is is alpha? Is alpha is gonna return zero if our character is not alphabetic. If our character is alphabetic, it's going to return uh, one. So when it, what is alphabetic? That's A to Z in capital and not capital. Okay, so if our character is not alpha, alpha, so it's not alphabetic, and, and then we have this weird statement here, so if our character minus uh, 48 is greater than nine, then we're gonna break. So what we want is we want our character to either be alpha or our character to be smaller uh, our character minus 30 to be smaller than nine. Uh, we can move this this uh, 48 here to the other side. So that's gonna be, we want our character to be uh, s smaller than uh, 57, because that's 48 plus nine is 57. So we want our character to be smaller than 57 or to be in the alphabet. Okay. And that's for every character in our payload. Now, what does our payload contain? Our pa or in our input, our input is our payload. Our payload contains our shellcode, our padding, and our stack address. Um, but the last nine bytes here are excluded, so the stack address is gonna be eight bytes, so we can kind of exclude the stack address here. So our shellcode and padding have to contain only alphanumeric values and bytes that are below 59, no, 57. Well, what bytes are below 57? Let's take a look at this ASCII table here. You have 57 and that's, so all the numbers and all of these other couple of characters. Let's take a look at what we inputted here. We inputted here some shellcode and as you can see, well, this is not a character. This is not an allowed character. All of these are not allowed, or a lot of these at least. So, okay, that, that's pretty much a no-go. We cannot use this payload, uh, this shellcode. 
So we have to start searching for a shellcode that's pretty much alphanumeric. So how do you find shellcode really quickly? Definitely if you're working for uh, like 46 bit on, on just a normal elf binary, it's very easy to find shellcode online. So we just Google alphanumeric shellcode 46 bits and I'm been a sage because I wanna spawn a shell. Okay, so we have this article here, which claims to contain some alphanumeric shellcode. So let's open that up and we see this is the shellcode and it's all just alphanumeric, so that's great. And above here we have the full string that we can copy. So let's copy this full assembled string. And let's use that as our shellcode, which I have done up here. So okay, our shellcode. Let's see if that runs and if that will get us a shell. And we get an end of file error. Okay, that's something weird that seems to happen on my machine. It's kind of strange. I don't fully understand why it happens on my machine, but just running again usually fixes it. So, okay. Now we have, we went into interactive mode and we didn't get an EOF, an end of file error, which means that this binary is still running, didn't quit yet, which means that we have a shell here. So we send ID and we get back that we are root. Perfect, great. So we have pawned this challenge. Last step is to make sure that it, all, that it also works on the remote. So we have the hack the box IP here and the port. And let's see if that works as well. And if we do an ls-la, we see, okay, flag.txt is here. So we have also, uh, it also works remotely, which is great. So that was the third video of this series, of this playlist. I hope you liked it. I hope you learned something new. As always, if you have anything that you want me to cover in the next video, something that you didn't understand or didn't quite get, have any questions, leave them down below and I will comment immediately as soon as I check it out. Hope you enjoyed it. Take care and I'll see you back in another video. Goodbye.